Hello and welcome to Polycarbs and my name is Christina and in this video I'll be taking the base mesh I made last week which was fairly rough and the texture on top was just a placeholder and finalizing the design before Omer John's paint over next week. I'll show you the process of sculpting all of those juicy details, both creating and rigging all of the tentacles, remeshing some parts of the model in a software called Instant Meshes to make a better optimized mesh with better topology overall, rigging the fingers and posing them, adding more complex PVR textures, and showing how to blend two PVR textures together. Oh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> okay, let's get started. So starting off this week, I wanted to start working on the tentacles first. I made sure to keep my placeholder tentacles in view for reference in terms of thickness, size, and so on. Since there are quite a lot of tentacles coming out from Pyramus's mouth, I knew that sculpting these would just take way too long. So I searched for some tutorials on how to create tentacles in Blender and came across this brilliant video from Alan Owen, who basically showed how to create tentacles from basically just low poly cylinders. I won't repeat this process in detail for you guys as his video, although it is narrated it's very easy to follow along with. So I'll make sure to link that below in the description and in the pinned comment. The basic idea is creating an array of these low poly cylinders in the Z axis using the array modifier, adding in an axis and scaling it down to control the distance between each cylinder and determining the taper at the end, since you know tentacles tend to taper down towards the tip and then adding in a curve and curve modifier to determine how the geometry bends. And yeah, basically you have an editable tentacle. This was perfect as I could custom pose each tentacle. And this just like saved me so much time than having to manually sculpt all of these individually. I just wanted to mention just in case you guys tried this, but I got this weird bug where I, every time I tried to duplicate a tentacle with all of the extra geometry and modifiers and everything attached, Blender would crash. So my work around this was to basically save the project while the tentacle was editable still, merge everything into just one mesh, copy that mesh with control C, reload the blend scene without saving, this is important, and then pasting that mesh in with Control v It's a bit of a hassle, but that way I still kept my unposed editable tentacle and my now static posed tentacle. I repeated that a few times and I basically had the final setup for my tentacles. Although when using this method, some of the suckers did get a bit too deformed and that's okay. I mean, when the lighting and everything is added, this is barely noticeable. Once the tentacles were sorted, I started working on the pincers and mandibles. Mandibles, is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> I found this horrific creature called a Dobson fly, and they are freaking huge and horrifying. I mean, holy crap. Thank God they don't exist here in the UK. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit loopy today. I've been up since like 4.30 and honestly, it's just gonna be one of those days. <laughs> So anyway, I used these for reference for the mandibles. I used ants as reference for the pincers. Since we won't be seeing either up close, I didn't want to spend too much time on these. Next, I started working on mostly the head, but I did jump around a lot. This week was super hectic work-wise and my brain was just all over the place, so I had to work on the sculpt sporadically whenever I had time. I eventually ran out of time in the end, so I didn't get to push the sculpt as far as I wanted, but I think with all of the textures added, it ended up looking pretty cool regardless. Following Omer John's texture sheet, the head was supposed to be more rough and angular, more rock-like basically, and the rest of the body more fleshy and organic, like vines or tree roots wrapping around something. 
the logic behind this character was just purely from a design perspective was having more details and more tension in the middle and having that tension release the further out you came from the center because we have this pyramid in the middle that acts like a sort of focal point, I imagine that it almost like warped the character's physiology. Like the pyramid was pulling the organic shapes in towards the middle. If you're working on a character sculpt or design, it's important to think about these rhythms in your design. These rhythms can tell you a lot about your character. If you're a painter or sketcher, you can think about sculpting like this. The brush strokes in an illustration can convey a certain type of mood or feeling. If you have softer brush strokes that blend together, it'll give a more relaxed feeling, a softer look. But if you have brush strokes that are rough and not blended very well, so you can clearly tell where one stroke starts and where it ends, that can convey more energy and drama. Sculpting is the exact same way. Bringing up our previous slide, just pay attention to the areas of rest where the surface is smooth and areas of detail where there are smaller strokes. This creates a sort of flow in the sculpt that brings your eyes down towards the center of the sculpt. I hope that all makes sense. Uh, this was what I had in mind throughout the entire sculpting process and I tried not to break this idea even though it was super tempting to add in all the details everywhere. <laughs> It's funny, because when you're a beginner artist, you think that, oh, when I get more advanced, I'll learn to add in more detail and make everything more complex looking. But it's almost the opposite. The more of an advanced artist you become, the better you become at choosing where to add detail and where to just have simplified shapes and surfaces. That's actually what separates beginner artists from more advanced artists. In beginner pieces, you can see that the artist has tried to cram in as much information and detail as possible, whereas the more advanced artist has held back quite a bit and chosen calculated areas to add detail in order to draw the viewer's eyes there. This is something Omarjan and I will be covering in a future Design Principles episode, but I thought it was important to mention it here to understand what I was thinking during this entire sculpting process. In terms of sculpting, the three main brushes I used was the crease brush, the snake hook brush, the inflate brush, and the smooth brush. Nothing fancy, no textured brushes or anything. I used the crease brush to create creases and indents in the form, and then held control to invert the brush and used this to create sharper, more angular surfaces and edges for the more hard surface areas like the head, the shoulders, and so on. Here's a sphere demonstrating what I mean. I create a crease and if I hold down control, I reverse the brush and go over on either side of the crease. Do you see what I mean? That area suddenly looks like it could be a more stone-like surface. For the organic areas, like the lower body and torso, I wanted a softer, more organic look, so I mainly just used the inflate brush here and the crease brush to make some nice creases. The snake hook brush was mainly just used to move the geometry around. Sometimes when staring at a sculpt for too long, you might be a bit blind to your proportions and errors. So as I kept working sporadically on the sculpt, I kept adjusting the overall silhouette to my liking. I deviated slightly from Omer John's design, but hey, that's okay. <laughs> For example, at some point in the sculpt, I started looking up emaciated people whose collarbones, ribs, and spines were super exposed and decided to change up the concept a bit to match up with this look. It just added to that eeriness factor and I actually ended up really liking this direction. Like his head and shoulders are quite wide and strong, but the closer you get to the pyramid, the more the form twists, withers away and becomes more abstract in nature. Of course, I didn't want pyramids to become too humanoid, so I took some creative liberty and deviated wherever it just felt right. Like the shoulder blades on the sky were super exposed and I thought it would be cool if I could kind of do the same thing but made my own shoulder blades that protruded in a cool way that made sense for the character. Once I was fairly happy, I merged the boolean and tried cleaning up the hole in his chest. Since the insides will be lit up 
quite a bit, I didn't really have to worry too much about that. But I made sure the transition on the outside looked good, especially the way these vines would twist inwards and outwards. I kept trying to balance where to add more holes and where these angular shifts would occur. It took a lot of experimenting and back and forth, but I eventually found a nice balance. Unfortunately, at this time, Blender was starting to chug due to the mesh now being super high poly, so I tried to refrain from using Dinotopo as, as much as I could and just sculpted without Dinotopo on. So the thing with Dinotopo is, it's great for blocking out geometry in the beginning, but the heavier the poly count, the more it slows down, so what you have to do is try to use Dinotopo whenever you feel the polygons are stretching too much, like when you use a snake hook or inflate brush, but use the brushes without the Dinotopo on when you're just smoothing surfaces or doing surface level detailing. For some reason, when you smooth with Dinotopo on, the polygons are more visible, but if you turn it off and then smooth, you'll get a smoother surface. This took me a long time to figure out, but eventually it became part of my workflow. Scrape and Peaks was another brush I used for some areas of the shoulders, head and horns as it smooths surfaces and creates these cool stylistic angular surfaces which really feeds into that hard surface feeling. If you're sculpting rock or maybe tech stuff, this brush is super good for that. For the cloth, I used a mix of the crease brush, both in normal and inverted mode, and the inflate brush. I knew that I'd pretty much just overlay a fabric texture on top of this mesh, so I didn't go into like crazy detail mode. I'm sure Omar John will come up with a more fancy solution in his overpaint. Mm, and now for the fun stuff. I started sculpting the hands in a neutral position as I knew I'd be rigging the fingers so it's always best to start off with a neutral pose first. Using my own hand as reference I kept looking back and forth which sped up the process quite a bit. If you can find a physical real world reference that's always the best option as you can turn it around as much as you want. I've covered rigging in a previous video, so I'll link to that on screen, but basically I just needed to press shift A, add in a bone under armature, extrude and line up the pulse where the fingers bend, and name the individual bones correctly with the suffix dot L at the end. This will tell Blender these bones are on the left side of the body, so if I then select all of the bones and under the armature menu in edit mode choose symmetrize, those very bones will be projected onto the other side and all of the bones there will end up with the suffix dot R. For some reason my origin axis was offset, so all I did was just move the right side to the right location. Since they're symmetrized now, if I then turn on X mirroring at the top of the screen and edit one bone, the bone on the other side will do the same. Now I tried without remeshing to rig my mesh, but I got a few error messages. So what I did was import the hands into instant meshes, choose an output, hit solve on both buttons, 
then extract mesh, choose where to save it, import that back into Blender, and then try reapplying the rig to the hands. What you do is you choose your mesh, shift choose your bones, and with control P, you choose set parent to, and then with automatic weights. And there we go. Choose the bones and head into pose mode, and you can start posing your fingers. I thought it would be easier to edit the bones if they were slimmer, so for this you can set display as stick under the viewport display window under the armature panel on the right. Since at this point Pyramus was quite symmetrical, I tried to pose the fingers a bit differently to offset that symmetry a bit and add more interest to the sculpt overall. I really, really wanted to add more surface detailing, but I just simply ran out of time, which sucks, but does happen sometimes. I also wanted to explore texture painting in detail and determine where to add different layers of roughness for the texture, as requested by a subscriber called Mango Fruit. but I didn't have enough time this week to explore this. I'm sorry, Mango, I'll definitely touch on this in the future. I, I hope I'm forgiven. Otherwise, I thought I'd show you guys my texture setup. The idea was that I wanted more rock-like texture at the top and then gradually have that rock turn more organic and slimy and so on. So what I did was set up two different texture groups. One contains the rock texture and the other contains the more organic texture for the body. Once you have one of these groups set up and you want to create another, you can choose all of the nodes except for the output duplicate the selection and just move them aside. And then if you want to group them, you can press Ctrl G. You then name your group and if you press the corner icon, you can look inside the group and you can go out of this menu by pressing the arrow button here. Here's a snapshot of how I arranged the organic skin shader. And here's how I arranged the stone shader. I'm pretty much a noob at texturing, but if you guys want to learn about this in detail, I highly recommend Jama's first clay pack on Gumroad or ArtStation, where he includes awesome clay textures as well as how he sets up his shader nodes. I'd also recommend his newly released tutorial that does include a section where he explains how to manipulate, tweak and blend one or more shaders. This is what I watched before I was able to put all of this together. Once you understand the logic behind it, it's not too bad actually. But yeah, Jama would explain this way better than me, so if you're really into texturing in Blender, definitely check out the links in the description and pinned comment below. And once we have the two groups ready, all we need is something to blend these two together, which is where the mix shader comes in. Press Shift A and in the search field just type mix shader and it should show up. We'll need to connect each of these groups into the shader inputs, and this is why we group them, because this interface would just become way too cluttered if we didn't. Next, we need to add in a color ramp. Again, just search for it and plug color into factor on the mix shader. Add in a gradient editor and plug the color into factor again, and finally add in a texture coordinate, but set the object to vector. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to have something visual within the scene to control the gradient effect. For this I chose to create an empty and in the texture panel I eyedropped picked that empty. The rotation wasn't quite right so I needed to rotate this a few times and voila! <laughs> I got an interactive gradient effect which I can tweak as much as I want. As mentioned before, I wanted the rock texture at the top to slowly fade into the organic skin texture towards the top of the hole. In the color ramp, I can choose how subtle or contrasty this exact transition will be. In the texture coordinates for each of the groups, I can choose how big the textures will be, how stretched they are, and where they'll be projected onto the model. I can tweak some of the other nodes as well, and as you can see, I get real-time feedback for my tweaks. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I just, oh, I love Eevee. I also chose to make the tentacles a bit of a different texture. Let's jump into the nodes and have a look. 
pretty much the same setup but with different textures chosen. Now, if you want to buy or get hold of textures that include diffuse, normal, displacement, roughness, maps, and so on, like the examples here, you'll be able to create some pretty realistic looking surfaces that interact with the lighting as well. I'll list where I got my textures in the description and pinned comment below. Now for the tentacles, I wanted some surface scattering action <laughs> as well as for the surface to be more slimy and reflective, so this is all tweaked in the roughness node through the color ramp. By moving the sliders, you'll get a few different effects. I wanted the suckers to be a different color, brightness, and even more slimy. So in edit mode, I chose the tentacles, inverted the selection with Control i duplicated the tentacles texture by pressing the number, and by doing this you create a copy, and renamed it Suckers. I then tweaked the texture until I got something that looked nice and hit Assign while the suckers were selected in edit mode. As an addition, I chose to press U, which brings up the unwrap window, and chose Project from View, which makes the texture less stretched. And since the final render will be taken from just one angle, I thought this would yield the best results. Repeat this for all of the tentacles and you get some pretty nice slime action. <laughs> As an addition, I chose to scale the tentacle texture in a negative Z axis, which gave me a nice tiling effect that felt more realistic for a tentacle rather than just like a smooth slimy surface. And yeah, that's basically it. Here's the final turnaround in clay shader mode. And here's the final turnaround once all the lighting, shaders, and so on is applied. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it? <laughs> although I didn't get to break up the shapes to make the sculpt more asymmetrical, and although I didn't get to explore the texture painting in full detail, I'm, I'm pretty happy. It gives Omerjan a bit more work to do, but that's what he deserves, that lazy bastard. <laughs> so here's the final slide, and yeah, I think this turned out pretty great. I learned a lot in this process and I honestly cannot wait to see the final paint of her. Ooh, and I also thought I'd tell you guys, for the next concept creation project we've started work on a full character design plus a prop that's meant to be for a top-down isometric video game and he's all sketched out so far and oh my god I love him. <laughs> you guys are gonna love him too, just you wait. That's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed and learned a lot alongside me and I hope to see you in the next video. As mentioned earlier, Omrijan will be painting over my final render in Photoshop next week, so that's going to be super fun. Thanks so much for watching guys and thanks for all the support so far. We really appreciate it. Bye!